Brilliant, brilliant, please. Amazing, amazing. It is absolutely brilliant here, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. You don't understand. I get up in loads of churches and I've got to be getting up and I'm like, wow, it's great here. And I'm lying, yeah? I'm lying. It's not great. You're like, oh, this is rubbish. And, uh, but it actually is good here. It really is. Fantastic. I am, I'm just back from the Edinburgh Fringe. When I was, um, when I was 15, because I, I, I was brought up in Musselburgh, just outside Edinburgh, and I used to go up to the Fringe and I would see comedians absolutely ripping Jesus to shreds. I would see comedians ripping the Christian faith to pieces. I would see them slagging off our faith. And... Um, I remember as a young 15-year-old lad saying, one day I'm going to be on that stage and I am going to lift up the name of Jesus. I'm going to lift his name up. And uh, I want to tell you that, you know, wow, the fringe is brutal and we had a lot of fun and it was the highs and the lows, but every single night, you know, we were able to put the cross right in that central place and it was so exciting. So praise God, praise God. So today's going to be a little bit different. I hope you're okay with that. It's not going to be a three-point sermon. I hope you're all right with that. If you've got a problem with that, you speak to the pastor, not me. Yeah, don't come and chat to me about that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, brother, where was the word today? Yes, I've brought my massive Bible. Um, so I want to quickly tell you a little bit about me. I've got a son called Jordan. Now, when I was, um, was kind of reading this book, I read this book about like, wow, you know, how this guy was bringing his son up and his son said to him, dad, can I be like you one day? And he also said, Dad, can I call you sir? And I thought, I want this. I want my son to be like, can I call you sir? And so basically, this guy, this preacher guy, he took his son everywhere. And so I thought, I'm going to take Jordan. So Jordan at that time was 15. And I was preaching in Birmingham. There was about 2,000 people. And I was preaching and Jordan was on the front row. And then at the end of the message, the leader said, listen, Mark, we've got a little side room. We've got about 60 leaders in there. Would you come and answer some questions? And I'm like, yeah, cool. So I get Jordan. Jordan's like, oh, 15. Oh, oh flipping egg, dad. So like, come on, son, come on. Look, get smiling, look good. And so we go into the little side room and I'm talking to these leaders and they're asking me all these questions and I'm answering. And then I see a little table with tea and coffee on it. And I said to Jordan in front of all these leaders, I says, hey, son, how about you jump up and get your dad a coffee? And in front of all these leaders, he went, how about you jump up and get it yourself? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was like, oh my good, there was like a synchronized buttock clench, yeah? Everyone's, mm, and uh, about 60 people went to get me coffee. It was embarrassing. It was embarrassing. And then on the way home, I was like, Jordan, flipping it, come on. I says, how about you jump up and get it yourself? He says, Dad, God has told me to keep you humble. Mm, mm. I says, well, that's good because God has told me to keep you in poverty. So we're all going to be fine, aren't we? We're all going to be fine, you little. Oh, I deeply, deeply regret teaching him how to speak. You know what I mean? Why did I do that? I taught him how to speak and now he's using it against me. It's like a nightmare. And so, um, but it's been a big year for me this year because my daughter got married. My daughter got married. That is lovely. That was really nice from you guys. That was like, yes. You were like, mm, and you never even bothered. You didn't even care. You were like, yeah, whatever, yeah. People get married, get over it. So my daughter got married, wow. 
And then all during the COVID days, we were like, oh, what's going to happen? Is it going to happen? Is it going to be one of those small weddings? But actually the wedding happened just as everything opened up and it was a really big wedding and she was absolutely delighted. And I was so emotional. I couldn't believe how emotional I was. Walking down the aisle, I was crying. Honestly, during the speeches, I was crying. All day I was crying until my dad, my dad came up to me. My dad was like, son, you are very emotional. Very emotional. He says, is everything okay? I says, dad, dad, this is costing me a fortune. This wedding. I was hoping for one of those little 15, you know what I mean? Only 15 people can come. Listen, kid, I'm sorry your mum couldn't see you get married, you know what I mean? But on the bright side, dad saved a few quid, yeah? So that's what I was hoping for, but nah. And then, wow, big, huge wedding. And then Kezia, my daughter, she says, dad, I want 10 bridesmaids. 10! 10 bridesmaids! What even is that? 10! I'm 55, I've not even got 10 friends, yeah? I've not even got, I've not collected 10 friends in 55 years. I do not think there are 10 people that I would save from a house fire, yeah? I, I'm like, 10! 10! I'm like, Kezia, she's like, dad, no, no, dad, 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 don't even start, don't even start. Every one of these girls means something to me. They're all part of my journey. They're all part of my story. I'm like, great, we're doing interviews, yeah? Let's do interviews. And I'll sit down and I'll decide how much of the, were you there when she was a kid at school? No, right, you're out, right. <laughs> and then the other thing is she's married an absolutely brilliant guy. He's called Gideon. He's a professional singer, songwriter. And uh, wow, his, his professional name is Jereb. He's brilliant. He's a really, really good guy. He's, um, he's had a couple of songs on Love Island. And I'm like, just make sure it's just his songs that are on Love Island. Yeah, let's just make sure about that, yeah. And uh, he's like fantastic, fantastic guy. But you know, I've got to be honest, on the day of the wedding, I'm doing the best um, father of the bride speech and I've really written it and I've made it funny and very compassionate and warm. And I'm thinking, yeah. And I'm thinking, great. Like this new guy, Kezia's new man. Oh, he's my number one. Well, let's see how he's going to do now, yeah? Let's see how he's going to do in the speech. So I did my speech, everyone loved it, it was fun. And then a best man speech, and then wow, here comes the new guy. Let's see what you've got, mate. He said a few things, said a few things. And then he said, could somebody bring me a keyboard? And he'd written her a song. He'd written, oh no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Everyone, oh, they're all crying. Oh, there's not a dry eye in the house. He's writing it. Everyone is loving it except me. I'm like, oh, I'm the man of this house, yeah? I'm there, I am writing her an opera, yeah? I am writing her an opera in Italian, yeah? Let's go, four hours, let's go. But it's been a big year for me. My daughter got married, but also my football team that I support, I live in Nottingham, my football team that I support Nottingham Forest have got, yes, have got up into the premiership, yeah? And it's like, whoa! And uh, basically, I love going to the football with my son, love going. And last season, we went quite a few times and there were some amazing matches. One of the matches that we went to was at Nottingham Forest were playing against Arsenal in the FA Cup. So at this point, Forest was still a championship team. The big London club were coming, Arsenal, and wow. And it was amazing. At half time, it was nil, nil. In most countries, that's nil, nil. But I'm Scottish. That is a victory in Scotland, yeah? <laughs> Do you remember when we beat the English at Wembley? Nil, nil, yeah? <laughs> I was going around England going, yeah, we beat you. They were like, it was nil-nil. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was like, 
Half time, nil, nil. We've got to come on, Forrest, you can do this. Halfway through the second half, the Forest guy scores. The crowd go absolutely crazy. We all go flying up. I grab my son. We're jumping up and down. We're knocked over. Suddenly, I'm jumping up and down with this complete stranger. And we're jumping up and down. And everyone's getting thrown everywhere. And then I get land back on my seat. And, oh, man. And then I turned to my son, Jordan, and I said... Oh, son, I think I've just licked a stranger. <laughs> My son's like, what? I said, he says, what have you done that for? I says, well, I was jumping up and down with this stranger. And I just saw his neck and I thought I'm just going to lick it. I licked his neck. Jordan's like, what? I says, oh, yeah, I guess COVID days, that's not great, is it? He goes, it's nothing to do with COVID. It's just been a normal human being. You don't lick people's legs. Oh, it was awkward the rest of the game. I couldn't really look at him, yeah? Because once you've licked a man's neck, you can't look at his face. It's like, oh, avoid eye contact. That's embarrassing. Listen, now, just to put you at ease, when we're out and I'm shaking hands at the back, don't everybody come up and go, oh, don't lick my neck, yeah, you're all right. I'm not going to lick your neck, unless you're a stranger, yeah. <laughs> so, not only has my daughter got married, not only has my football team been promoted, but also, unbelievably and amazingly, I've been married, I have been married for 30 years. 30 years! <laughs> Come on! Three, three different women. And uh, <laughs> what I like about that is you have some people going, mm, you look, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, one lady, one lovely lady called Tamsin. And I said to Tamsin, we've been married for 30 years. You, we've got to celebrate this. What are we going to do? And Tamsin says, I want to go to Vietnam. <laughs> I, I'm sitting in the cafe and I'm like, say that again. She says, I want to go to Vietnam. I goes, I've been married to you for 30 years. I've never heard you mention Vietnam once. She goes, I want to go to Vietnam. Okay, we're going, we're going. So we go to Vietnam. She goes, I don't want one of those kind of package deal holidays. I want to work it out all myself, get an amazing itinerary, great stuff, good. So she sorts it all out, it's beautiful. And one of the things she wants to do is go up into the mountains of Vietnam and stay in one of these homesteads and we stay with a family. And we did and it was fantastic, absolutely brilliant. Now then, when you've been married to someone for 30 years, you have little kind of ways of communicating to tell the other person how to shut up, yeah? When you're in public, yeah? You've, you've all worked it out. You're like little ways of going, mm, that's enough, yeah? Whether it's an ear, a little touch, or a kick under the table, or an elbow in the ribs. That's like the way of saying, yeah, shut it. And uh, Tamsin doesn't use any of those. Tamsin uses her eyebrows. She has got savage eyebrows, yeah? Her eyebrows need a muzzle, yeah? Because they are savage. If she raises one eyebrow, it means shut it. If she, means, if she raises both of them, it's like lie down, yeah? Lie down, play dead. And, uh, and we're there in this beautiful Vietnam and we're there and we go into the family's house and the mother of the house has cooked us all this food. And have you ever looked at a table and you do not recognize anything on the table? You're like, where's the chicken? Where is the chicken? Rice, anything, chips, I can't. Everything is totally different. And it's, a lot of it is gelatinous kind of looking stuff, wobbling stuff. A little bit's got eyeballs that are looking up at you. You're looking at the eyeballs. And oh, I'm thinking, oh. And I see one plate in particular and I think, oh, that looks, yes, that looks very unusual. It looked like if you crunched into it, something would squirt into your mouth. Oh. But you know, I'm like, do you know what? I've got like a cement mixer for a stomach, yeah? So I thought, come on, I can do this. 
So I'm like, yeah, have some of it. And sure enough, crunched into it and ooh. And it was like, ooh. And then, but I can see that my wife is, she's seen that plate, she's thinking, ah. She's eating all this stuff. She's like, I'm not going near that. And then the lady of the house, I just, she used to call her Mrs. Tamsin. And she said, Mrs. Tamsin, Mrs. Tamsin, you try. And after 30 years of marriage, I went for it. I went, yeah, Mrs. Tamsin, Mrs. Tamsin, you try. Oh, oh, her eyebrows were growling. I mean, oh, nothing is better than seeing your wife eat something and then have to immediately pick up a tissue and put it under the table. Lovely, lovely, lovely. But I don't know, this did happen at the fringe. I have to say this. I, I told a little story. Well, I'll tell you it now, but it, it really did bring out the weirdest heckle that I've ever had in my life, right? I told a story about, um, well, I, I, I told this, I started this because I was saying, oh, we must eat everything that's put in front of us. And this is absolutely true. That like, um, when I was at Bible college, we were told that when you go out of ministry in the churches at the weekend, you must eat everything that's put in front of you. Most of you would be like, yes, that's, that's good manners. Yeah, well, these two guys came back with the best story ever. What had happened is that they went to minister in Wales and then they were in this family's house on the Sunday having Sunday dinner and the first plate came through chicken potato veg everything gravy plastered all over it and the plate was given to the first guy and she went to get the second plate and the young student he panicked he goes oh we've been told we must eat everything everything that we we must everything but I hate gravy I cannot eat gravy so the other one says, well, just tell the lady, it'll be fine. So she comes through with the plate and he says to her, oh, eh, is it possible to have mine without the gravy? And the lady says, yeah, no problem. She takes the plate, she calls the dog and she says, just the gravy. And the dog licks the gravy off the plate. Oh, she brings it up and gives him it. Oh, that is fantastic. What was brilliant is a lady from London, a lady from London came to me and she was like, isn't it marvelous how intelligent the dog is to just eat the gravy? Isn't that wonderful? And I'm like, oh, this is controversial what I'm about to say. No, no, dogs are thick, right? That's my controversial point of the day. Dogs are thick. My dog ate a whole mobile phone, right? Straight down. Dogs are thick. And people go, no, no, dogs are not thick. Dogs are not thick. Think about sheep dogs. Sheep dogs are amazing. Look how they herd the sheep into the pen. No. That does not show us that sheep dogs are clever. That shows us that sheep are even thicker than dogs. Yeah? Sheep, the 60 of them, have they never thought to go, 60 of us, one of them, we could take him, yeah? Let's do it. They never do it, they just all go in. But we were talking about this, and I said, has anybody here ever been in a restaurant and complained, right? And this guy shouts out in the fringe, he shouts out, yeah. I like apple crumble with milk and they brought custard. And everyone in the room was like judging him. Milk. I thought that is weird. And then a guy over here just shouts out, just shouts out randomly. He just shouts out this. He says, always put a bit of salt in your pot noodle. <laughs> I've got a couple of things about that. Yeah, firstly, Pot noodles, everybody accepts, tastes rubbish, yeah? Everybody in the world, when you buy a pot noodle, you're like, that is rubbish, it tastes rubbish. What you, I mean, what's a bit of salt gonna do to change that? So, oh, I like a little bit of salt in my pot noodle. I think I would like to write the instructions on the side of a pot noodle. Step one, take off the lid. Step two, take the sachet out. Step three, put the boiling water up to the line. Leave for two minutes. In those two minutes, contemplate in your life how things have got to such a low level, yeah? <laughs> things have got to such a bad state that you're about to eat a chicken and mushroom pot noodle, yeah? 
Step four, take the pot noodle, stick it in the bin. Step five, go and get yourself a Greg sausage roll. That's what we should be saying on the side of a pot noodle. You know it's true. You know it's true. Well, listen, um, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. A lot of you are thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I, I knew it was going to be different today, but I didn't want it to be this different. Yeah, I'm... But I did want to tell you that my son worries about me when I'm out and about because he thinks I shouldn't be allowed out in public because I've got this thing, right? Now, this thing that I've got, it's not road rage. You know road rage is where lovely, nice people that are beautiful and lovely, they get behind a wheel and they become animals, yeah? Yeah, you all know who I'm talking about. People are actually pointing to people right now. It's him. Well... I've got a friend who's actually a minister of a church. Not this church, just to make sure. Um, but I've got a friend who's a minister of a church. And he's a lovely guy. He's like, oh, joy, peace, hope, life, grace. Yeah? He's lovely. And he gets behind the wheel and he becomes savage. He is a horrendous human being. He shouts things he should not be shouting. He makes gestures that he should not be making, yeah? And I said to him, mate, that is not good. He goes, yeah, I've had to kind of peel my smile, Jesus loves you, badge off the back of my car. Because <laughs> you can't. You can't have a smile, Jesus loves you badge when you're making those kind of gestures. It doesn't go together. But no, I've not, got, I've not got road rage. What I've got is something called litter rage, yeah? Litter rage. And what litter rage is, I've always had it, that if I see someone chucking stuff on the floor, it really bothers me. It really bothers me. I remember when the kids were young and we took them to McDonald's and were sitting in the car and it was raining and the two kids were in the back and they're eating, you know, eating their McDonald's, eating the burger, eating the chips, eating the box. It all tastes the same. And... Uh, <gasps> there and it's like this car pulls up next to us and this sporty car and the music's blasting and they're eating the stuff and then poof, out the windows the little wind, electric window comes down and all the garbage poof, onto the ground and then in our car there's my little lad he's nine years old and he's like dad no 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 dad no no it's too late i'm out the car yeah i'm out the car and i'm round and i'm picking it up and i'm like oh lads this is an absolute disgrace this is disgusting let me put it in the bin for you why don't i put your rubbish in the bin and i go over and i put it in the bin and i'm like and I'm just making my way back to the car and the window comes down and the guy goes, cheers, mate. <laughs> so I've always had it. I've always had it. This kind of little rage. But this is absolutely 100% true. Six weeks ago in Nottingham, where I live, I'm walking up, minding my own business, and there's 10 lads, 10 lads, all of them 15, 16, eating KFC, eating chicken, having a big chicken bucket of chips. They're all walking along, chatting away. Well, you know, like 15 to 16 year old lads, it's not so much chatting, is it? It's more like. <laughs> And uh, they're kind of like chatting like that. And then I'm walking, ignoring them. And then suddenly, there they are, chucking their buckets onto the ground, chucking all the stuff on the ground. And I'm immediately like, oh. And I do that thing that you can do when you're a Scottish guy in England. If you're Scottish and you live in England, what you need to do is speak very slowly in Scottish because when you speak slowly in Scottish it scares the pap out of the English yeah so I went oh lads that's an absolute disgrace you should be ashamed of yourself this is disgusting and I'm picking up the stuff and these lads none of them say anything they're looking at me and I'm like, yeah, all of you, ashamed of yourself. And I'm walking across the road and I'm feeling amazing. 
I'm like, wow, one Scottish guy, 10 of these lads, I'm doing amazing. The music's playing in my head, right? I'm like William Wallace. I'm like freedom. This is incredible. I've taken on 10 English lads and I've shown them a few things. And then I tripped on the curb and fell on my face. I honestly did. Tripped on the curb, fell on my face. Very difficult to tell them. It's very hard to be hard man act when you're lying on the floor with KFC in your face. Yeah, let that be a lesson to you, yeah? But listen, I wanted to tell you something that happened last August. Last August, I like to go running in the morning. Nah, go running in a little kind of like um, country bit where there's loads of trees and bushes. I like to have a little run and then I always like to stop halfway around and have a little wee, yeah? Have a little wee behind one of the trees. Sometimes I change the tree that I wee behind, yeah? Just to keep things fresh, yeah? And um, have a little wee and uh, I thought, oh, that does not look good. That does not look good. So when I go home, I says, oh, Tamsin, because, you know, guys, we're always just like our wives. Yeah. Oh, Tamsin. So I was like, oh, I had a little wee. She goes, did you do it behind the bush? Yeah, I did it behind the bush. And she goes, um, I says, oh, it didn't look great. She goes, well, when you have your next wee, let me know and we'll have a little look. So sure enough, we both had a little look. She goes, oh, Mark, I think that might be blood in your wee. I said, oh, no. She says, you better phone the doctor. I says, no, 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 no. Come on, I don't want to phone the doctor. She goes, no, you, I think you need to. So I phoned the doctor. The doctor says it was kind of COVID time. So the doctor says, listen, probably get an appointment for a week on Tuesday. I'm like, yeah, no, that's cool. And then he's taking my details and then he says, sir, what exactly? And I told him what it was. And as soon as I told him what it was, he says, oh no, forget a week on Tuesday. I'd like to see you in the next 45 minutes. So it's gone from a week on Tuesday to the next 45 minutes. Before I know it, I'm sitting in a doctor's surgery and he's doing lots of tests and then there's words getting thrown around and suddenly there's the word cancer being used and there's like, gonna have to have further tests. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, no, this cannot be true, this cannot be real. Suddenly I'm like, my own mortality is looking at me in the face. Suddenly I'm like, what is this? I can't die now. <sighs> no, this is wrong. And she's listening, Mr. Ritchie, we're gonna have to get you a test in the hospital. And I had to wait for a month where I have these big tests. And during that time, my head is bursting. My own mortality is looking at me, that too close for comfort, staring at me in the face, asking big questions of me. I go and have the big tests and then the doctors come in and they say, we're really glad to tell you, Mr. Ritchie, that everything is clear. You've got completely, a clear, totally clear. And in that, in that hospital, totally professional setup, I was sitting there, this is, it's totally clear. I jumped up in the air, I punched the air. I should not have licked the doctor. I should not have licked the doctor. I don't, I'm not proud of that, I shouldn't have done it. But you know, I, I really had this moment of like, wow, my mortality is staring me in the face. And the three things that happened to me during that was this, firstly, I was overcome with gratitude that I was given a few more days, that I was given a little bit more time. I grabbed my wife and I grabbed my kids and I pulled them tight. And I says, guys, I love you. Making sure that they always know that I care for them and full of gratitude. The second thing was I started to get very philosophical and I started to think things like, what would happen if I was to die today, what would I be most disappointed that I hadn't completed? And I go all philosophical and I put it out on my social media. If you were to die today, what would you be disappointed that you hadn't completed? And somebody wrote back, Wordle. Yeah, wordle, that's oh, so great, thanks for that. But the third thing that I felt and the third thing that I thought was, oh man, am I okay with God? 
Am I tight with God? Has some space come between God and me? Have I drifted from God? You know, all of us, we have that moment where we think, I'm going to see God face to face. Am I tight with God? Has stuff come between us? You see, a couple, a few years ago, Tamsin and me, we went to Australia, we went to Brisbane, we went to the Gold Coast, it was beautiful. And I was swimming in the sea, and I'm a pretty decent swimmer, but oh my goodness, the undercurrents are so strong and pull you down. It felt like I was in a washing machine. And I got out and I was like, oh man, this is tough. And then basically what happened was I went and spoke to the lifeguards. And when I spoke to them, they said, oh, Mark, you know, just a few days before you got here, they said, we had this like nine-year-old girl. She's an Australian girl. She's a great swimmer. Everybody was out in the sea. It was fantastic. But then the undercurrents turned. And suddenly the sea became ferocious. And the lifeguards came and they called everybody in. And basically they said, get in as quick as you can. But this little girl was struggling. And the lifeguards couldn't go in because the sea was too, uh, un, absolutely out of control. So they got this rescue can and they threw the rescue can to her. But this little girl was going under the water and she was, says she didn't know what this was. She didn't know that this was the rescue plan for her. She didn't understand. She was going under the water. She was in such turmoil. And then her head went under and they said, we thought we'd lost her. But then suddenly her head comes out the water and it's like there's a light bulb moment. And she's like, grab the rescue can. And she grabbed it and they pulled her in. And her dad was running along the beach, sobbing his heart out. And he scoops up his little girl and holds her tight. And friends, I want to say to you that God, he saw that we were in turmoil. He saw that we had drifted away from him. He saw that we were in trouble. And he threw out the rescue plan. He threw out the Jesus dying on the cross. John chapter 3 verse 16. God so loved you and me. God so loved the world that he gave his son to die on the cross so that we could grab hold of that rescue plan that we could be pulled in and that Father God could hold us tight. That wow, God has made it possible for you no longer to drift away from Him, for you no longer to be in turmoil and feel like the world is too crazy, but to get hold of the cross and to come through the cross into the arms of God. So friend, what I'm gonna do is this. I realized in that moment, is that through the cross, I can be tight with God, that I can never be afraid of dying because I know that I'm safe in his arms. And what I'm going to say to us today is simply this. In a moment, I'm going to pray a really short and little prayer. And I'm going to invite you to pray the prayer after me. Don't, don't say it out loud so people can hear it. But pray it in your heart today. And as you pray it, we're going to get to the bit where we're going to say, Amen. And then I'm going to count to three and I'm going to say, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I'm going to ask that you put your hand up. Now I've brought some books with me today and the team would love to let you have one of those books. And as you put your hand up, the team will come and put a book into your hand. Please just take that. That's for you to have. Stick it under your chair. Let's just bow our heads, close our eyes in the presence of God. And as every head's bowed and every eye's closed. Friend, I want you to know that you are tight with God, that there's no space come between you and God, that you have not drifted away from Him. As I pray this prayer, why don't you pray in your heart 
today. This is the prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus. I'm sorry for drifting away. I'm sorry for my stuff. I come through the cross into your arms. Thank you for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. As our head stays bowed and our eyes are closed for just a few more moments, I'm going to count to three. And as I count to three, if you prayed that prayer, we'd love you to have one of these books. Then I want you to slip up your hand. One, two, three. That's great. Put your hand. That's really, really good. The team are making their way to you now. That's really great. Keep your hand up really high. That's fantastic. That is absolutely wonderful. It's wonderful to see hands up all around the auditorium right now. This is wonderful. Team, you're doing a great job. Still a few here at the front. That is amazing. Isn't it great that the team are having to work hard to get everyone? Still a few here at the front, guys, if you can help us. Wonderful. So good. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that when we sing about the cross, it's not just a symbol. It's not just something that has got nothing to do with our lives. But it is the most beautiful thing. The cross is the rescue plan that you designed so that we could be safe in your arms. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it has been such a thrill and joy for me to talk my nonsense to you. And uh, isn't it wonderful to think that there are people who have responded to God today. Isn't that fantastic? Say like, God, you're amazing. God bless you guys.